1916, the mathematician Ramanujan looked at the following very strange function, which he called delta of q. q times 1 minus q times 1 minus q squared times 1 minus q cubed, and on and on. And then all of this raised to the 24th power. For no particular reason, he decided to multiply it out. And when he did, he got this strange sequence of numbers. While most people wouldn't have looked twice at this list, Ramanujan noticed something very strange. If you took this number and multiplied it by this number, it equaled this number. Another observation. If you wrote out some more coefficients and you took this number times this number, it equaled this number. In other words, the coefficients of this function were multiplicative. The nth coefficient times the mth coefficient equals the nmth coefficient, whenever n and m were co-prime. Ramanujan himself didn't know how to prove this, and he conjectured it in what is now a very famous 1916 paper. What we now know is that Ramanujan's identity is reflective of the fact that these are no ordinary numbers. They actually contain some very deep meaning. In this video, we'll see what the true meaning of these numbers is, and how they form a bridge between number theory and complex analysis. We'll then see how that bridge leads to the proof of Fermat's last theorem. In a bit more detail, that's because the function that Ramanujan discovered is not alone but actually belongs to a very huge family of functions that we now know are very deep. The numbers that appear in their coefficients have an interesting hidden meaning. These are functions that we call modular forms. This video is an intro to what modular forms are and how they proved Fermat's last theorem. For the sake of concreteness, I'll focus on this one here. Our story begins in the 1950s with mathematicians Martin Eichler and Goro Shimura. They looked at the coefficients of this modular form and wanted to understand their true meaning, so to speak. The first key step was to visualize this function in the complex plane. Here the variable q is a complex number in the interior of the unit circle in the complex plane. To find the true meaning of the coefficients of the modular form, they took a curved arc in the circle and integrated the modular form over that curved arc. That is, they added up the values of this function over the arc. That gives you a complex number. Let's plot that over here on the right. Now take another arc in the circle and integrate the function over that arc. That gives you another complex number. Let's plot it on the right. Now do that for more and more arcs in the circle. Slowly, you notice that a pattern starts forming on the right. The values on the right form a lattice in the complex plane. The next insight is that this lattice has a very deep connection to number theory. To see it, it might be helpful to look at one dimension lower. Suppose that you have a one-dimensional lattice, just a bunch of evenly spaced dots on the number line. How do you relate this lattice to something that lives in the world of number theory? Well, you can do the following thing. Take a function that repeats in every portion of this lattice. So what we've drawn is the sine function. It's periodic. Then. Set the variable x to equal sine of t, and set the variable y to equal cosine of t. And notice that they satisfy the following equation, x squared plus y squared equals 1. So we started off with a lattice, and ended up with an equation, which lives in the world of number theory. What we'll do now is an analogous process in higher dimensions. Given this lattice, we'll look at a higher dimensional analog of sine, which repeats in every square of the lattice. The function you're looking at right now is called the Weierstrass p function. Set x equal to p of z, and y equal to p prime of z. Then x and y satisfy this rather complicated looking equation. So just like before, we started off with a lattice, and we cooked up something which lives in the world of number theory, an algebraic equation. Now this equation over here is given a fancy name, it's called an elliptic curve. Let's summarize what we've done so far. We started off with a modular form. From it, we cooked up a lattice. And from that lattice, we produced this equation over here, an elliptic curve. But we started off the video wanting to know, what is the hidden meaning of the coefficients of this modular form? The point that we're leading up to is that they are exactly reflected in the number theory of this elliptic curve. But how is that so? Well, in the world of number theory, a standard question people ask when given an equation is the following.
How many solutions are there to this equation mod p, where p is a prime number? For example, if p equals 5, then the pair 4, 1 is a solution mod p. That is, if you substitute x equals 4 and y equals 1, you'll see that the two sides are congruent mod 5. Similarly, one can check with the brute force search that there are four solutions to this equation mod 5, listed here. We can do this for every prime number p. So for every prime number p, we can count the number of solutions to this equation mod p. For p equals 2, there are five solutions. For p equals 3, there are five solutions. Likewise, you can fill this out for all primes p. Now, this list of numbers doesn't look too interesting at the moment. Here comes the magic. Instead of considering the number of solutions mod p, consider this slightly weirder thing. 1 plus p minus the number of solutions mod p. Here are the updated numbers. The point is, these numbers exactly match the coefficients of our modular form. For example, the number here is negative 2. And the second coefficient of our modular form is negative 2. The number here is minus 1, and the third coefficient of the modular form is minus 1. Likewise for all of the other numbers. We started off the video saying that the coefficients of a modular form have a hidden meaning. We can now see what this is. These coefficients somehow count the number of solutions to an algebraic equation living in an opposite corner of math. They have a strange predictive power. In other words, we have two worlds, modular forms and elliptic curves. What we've done is, to a modular form, we've attached to it an elliptic curve. But it wasn't until many years later that people dared to suggest that you might be able to go back, that maybe every elliptic curve came from a modular form. Now when you first hear this, a reasonable reaction is that it seems very unlikely. But in 1967, this feeling was formalized into a conjecture that became known as the Taniyama Shimura conjecture. Every elliptic curve over Q is modular. That is, for every elliptic curve over Q, there is a modular form whose coefficients are essentially the number of solutions mod p to this elliptic curve. Now the trouble with this conjecture is that nobody knew how to begin attacking it. John Coates, a very well-known number theorist, said, beautiful though this problem was, it seemed impossible to actually prove. And then 20 years later, the stakes were raised even higher when Frey, Serre, and finally Ribbit showed that the Taniyama Shimura conjecture implied Fermat's last theorem. There was a joke at the time that this was reducing one impossible problem to another equally impossible problem. But unbeknownst to the rest of the math world, somebody had been working in secret to prove the Taniyama Shimura conjecture for seven years, and in September 1994, Andrew Wiles announced that he could prove enough of the Taniyama Shimura conjecture that Fermat's last theorem would then follow. Specifically, he proved the following statement. Every blank elliptic curve over Q is modular. The blank over here is an adjective, semi-stable. And it was known that this statement was enough to prove that Fermat's last theorem was true. Slowly, slowly, in the years after, people started removing conditions on the theorem. So the Taniyama Shimura conjecture was then proven for all curves that were semi-stable at 2 and 3. Then it was proven for all curves satisfying an even weaker technical condition. And then in 2001, the full conjecture was proven by Breuil, Conrad, Diamond, and Taylor. And thus, a theorem that first seemed impossible to attack just 40 years later was completely solved. That's all for this video. With that, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next video.